Hello, I'm Josh Starmer, and welcome to Human Stories in AI, brought to you by StatQuest. In this series, we'll hear about the career journeys of passionate AI experts, from their humble beginnings to conquered challenges. We'll be inspired by the real-world experiences of professionals thriving in the ever-evolving AI landscape. Today, we have special guest Brian Risk, a multi-talented data scientist and the president and founder of Devra.ai, a company specializing in automated coding. Brian is also a great personal friend of mine and an amazing musician. So, without further ado, Brian, can you tell us about your journey to where you are right now as founder of Devra.ai? How did this all start? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I guess there's there's the long story and there's the the short story, and I'll keep I'll keep the long story uh, relatively short. Um, but my my career has been like back and forth, and I've tried a, a lot of different things. I was um, I was a bartender at a music club for a long time. I was a high school math teacher. Um, I was just like a you know entry level programmer. But all through the course of it, I've had a real affinity for data and sort of was in the programming field as uh, data science was emerging as a viable like career and what people started labeling their their job. And um, I have a degree in math. And so like having math and computer science tied that together. And I, I feel like I, I lucked into this one job that was a bioinformatics job where it was incredibly interesting and it essentially there was protein data from tumors and there was uh dna data and you know th through a rather complicated process coded dna uh is translated into uh proteins and so the idea behind this lab was that for a uh, proteins that you find in cancers, those might be coming from spots on the DNA that are not supposed to code at all. And so the elevator pitch is kind of like 99 point some percent of our genome is not supposed to code. It has other functionality or perhaps even no functionality. That is a matter of debate from what I understand. Um, so if part of that 99.5 starts to code, then you, then you have some problems. And, and so the, the software I wrote had a few cr uh, criteria, like it had to match a lot of data to a lot of data, a lot of protein data to a lot of genomic data. And, uh, and so you had to have, that had to have like huge amount of speed and it had to have a, a huge amount of, um, uh, like it had to be very accurate algorithm or else you would get uh, too many false positives to be viable. Um, and that sort of kicked off my data science career. From that point forward, I started calling myself a data scientist and I, um, I, I lucked my way into that job. I, like, I think I got it on, on just being excited about it. And I feel I was successful at that job because I had, uh, a, a strong like uh, curiosity about the data and uh, like a desire to learn more about it. And um, one of my favorite StatQuest videos is your ABCs of data science. And I think that's what the title is. Um, <laughs> but ABC stood for always be curious. And uh, for intro data scientists, or just data science, you know, for everybody, I, I feel like curiosity about the data is like the fundamental key to success because it's that curiosity that drives you to learn about like at a granular level what you're looking at. You could have, you know, a billion rows in your database uh, and try to treat it as some sort of a, a holistic entity, but like to look at, you know, these are individual like people or records and like, what do they represent and what are the outliers? And like, what is, what does the data look like at that level? And then at like a rolled up level. And then you need curiosity about like the results you produce, you know, often we are the ones providing some sort of 
set of ground truth and we're, we're, we're writing predictors or we're writing classifiers and, uh, you know, the numbers that our classifiers are making, uh, are putting out, do those make sense? Do you know, are you trying that with your data? Are you seeing if what you saw on the granular level is, uh, is in fact like being reflected in the results that you're being paid to produce, you know, uh, and, and people will take your results and they will use them. So it's, it is up to us to like, to be self validating and to, to like produce quality work and, and like there's drive for like money um, and a job will only get you so far. Like you, you yourself have to be curious of like, you know, was, you know, was random forest the way to go? Like, and how does, like, how does that, you know, com compare to, um, you know, K means or, or something like that? Like, are you trying different methods and uh, are you, are you, um, are you, are you validating it that way? And mm -hmm. so, um, I think the original question was like, how did I get where I am now? That was, this yeah, has exactly. been all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is a step back. So you had this bioinformatics job and you're working with all this proteomics and protein data and genetics mm -hmm. data, and it was lots of data. And that's when you kind of decided that you could officially call yourself a data scientist. I managed to like publish uh, two papers in that time. So like I, mm -hmm. I also um, like I, f I feel legitimately I'm a scientist, you know, that's uh, uh, like even, even though, you know, you're everyone feels like a fraud all the time. And, you know, I don't want to say I feel like it more than others. But like I, I'm like, I feel like most of what I where I am right now is just due to luck and some degree of being a nice person and people just wanting to work with me. Yeah, so you not only did you have a lot of data, you did science with that data. So that is the perfect data scientist. I mean, <laughs> lexicographically, like that's just how, uh, yeah, it, it just makes sense that I'm a data scientist. It's perfect. And so what happened after that? Um, after that, that that lab unfortunately just imploded and, and dissolved. And uh, I feel like, there's all this great work we were doing that never sort of went forward. And so, um, you know, with, with kids, you have to, uh, you know, you can't be unemployed for too long. Uh, and, and so like a lot of people, like with math degrees, you sort of, you turn to the dark side, which is advertising. And uh, there's, there's a lot of call for data science within the, the, the field of advertising and so I got, I got a job, um, uh, it, like in, in various like advertising agencies. Um, and the way data science generally works in advertising is every, every ad you show to a person costs money. So if you, if you can reduce that number of ads to only the people that are actually truly interested in whatever is being advertised, then it, for the advertiser, it makes it cost less money for them and they are, they are happy. And, um, and so, so that's where data science sort of comes in. It comes into this predictive, uh, field of, you know, some basic things about like for digital advertising, like, you know, what time of day a person is, is seeing the website and what browser they're on and what, you know, generally, you know, what geography, you know, geographic characteristics, like what state they're in and uh, like, and what website they're coming from. That's an important one. Uh, all that, all those things come together for you to be able to make a prediction of, of um, are they, you know, good to show ads to one of, one of the data curiosity things that happened just yesterday was um, I was doing an analysis for, this uh, for for English muffins, and I I was um was you know seeing like which you know which type of people love English muffins, which people tend to not like English muffins, and here's the weirdest correlation or anti correlation I've I've seen so far. 
If you are a car aficionado, if you love cars and you visit websites about cars, you don't like English muffins. You're, I don't know what that, I don't know what that is, but basically like we, you, uh, I scored websites, sorted them by uh, P values, uh, which was calculated with Fisher's exact and, um, and the lowest P values for the negative like indicators were all car related. And like, I wonder like what drives that? I mean, no pun intended, but like, what, <laughs> what is it about owning a car? Me like, yep, I, I want to look at this Mustang picture means when someone's like, would you like an English muffin, sir? They're like, get that out of here. What do That's I look hilarious. like to you? I, one, I, f I find it hard to imagine anyone would not like an English muffin. I, oh, they're I, delicious. Have a British, I, I love a good English muffin. Mm. Uh, they're, uh, they're buttery they're, they're, they're crevices. They're, crispy, yeah. they're buttery. They're, mm. they're soft yeah. and tender on the inside. There, there's nothing not to like about it. I mean, who doesn't like those things? But, uh, but I could imagine, um, you know, if, if, uh, it might just be that like when someone's looking at a website about cars that they're really just thinking about cars. And the last thing they're thinking about is like breakfast. <laughs> so it's, it's so encompassing. You like, yeah. a, you know, a, a dog could be biting their leg and yeah. they're just oblivious to it. Cause they're, yeah. they're thinking about the, like the next yeah. the Tesla model that's going to come out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, don't get in the way of me thinking so, about yeah. cars. Um, I would, I would love so, to yeah. eat right now, but I'm just thinking about cars. Yeah. So tell us, uh, so you've, you've got these jobs. Uh, what led to mm -hmm. sort of your current thing? How'd you get to where you're, uh, you, you know, you've got this spinoff or this, yeah. maybe it's not a spinoff. You've got your own company that you've, you've got, you've my got own company. Um, how did, which where did is, that come from? And, and, and how has that developed? I, f I feel like it's sort of a, like an offshoot of this, the curiosity, like the number one, the ABC of data science, you mm -hmm. you have a curiosity for things. And I, f I feel hand in hand that, that sort of goes with a desire to create. And and so, you know, I have a full time job and I have three kids and I'm a single dad. And I um, and I also like have this desire to like make these things. And so I, I started uh, D.AT Analytics um, and I'm working on the new like the new project, which is Devra at uh, mm -hmm. and this just sort of came from a curiosity. All these, you know, AI took off in 2022, the tail end of it and open AI provided these APIs so that you could sort of hook into their pipes and use their raw AI processing and, and back end to like power, like whatever crazy thing you want to think of. And uh, there's been a ton of creativity there. And there's been a ton of, I, I feel like fear and criticism around like, like AI, the, the fear is, will it replace us? The criticism is like, uh, when you look at what it produces, it's not that original, you know, like you would never, you would never create like a, a like a compelling screenplay from Chad GBT. It's, it's just too bland. And, um, but the thing is, is with writing code, you want bland. You want what everybody has done. You want to you want to open up a code project that you've never seen before, and you want to know what you're getting. You're not, and and so many of these problems, like login screen or um, you know, like data science problems, like uh, K means analysis, um, they have been solved thousands of times before and have been documented on various websites like Stack Overflow. And when you're doing this problem, you're you're essentially reinventing the wheel every time you sit down and type things with your fingers and use your mind. Um, and so for so much of coding, it feels like at, at least 80 percent of a lot of code is is has already been done before. And that's where AI really shines. And so this this new tool, Devra, that I've been working on is. Um, 
tries to really leverage that. And, um, and if, and you can use coding, um, you can use chat GPT to help you with coding. You can say, Hey, uh, I'm working on this. Here's the function I have. How can I improve it? Or, um, or, or, you know, can you write a unit test for it? And you've got to like write everything about what you want it to do and paste in the function and like paste in any like supporting classes or, or anything like that. And, and then type your question. And so the, the current thing that I'm working on was, was sort of born of this idea that you don't need to do all this copying and pasting all the time. Um, the code is on your computer. If you could just let the AI explore your code and figure out what it needs to do and what it needs to add, then all you really have to do is just the prompt that says, could you write the unit test for this function? And it finds the function and it, uh, like looks at the contents of the function and then it, you know, adds to your current, uh, suite of unit tests. And like, I don't, Josh, you and I were just talking about unit tests. Uh, they're, I don't, I don't think I'm alone in this. They're the most boring thing to write. There's the <laughs> most frustrating, um, because you just, you just wrote the thing that, uh, like is the functionality you wanted to create and a unit test is like, okay, but do you really believe it? And you have to like mock up all the data, like all the inputs. And like, if there are any like database calls, you have to mock those. And if there's any like other function calls, you have to like mock those responses. And it's, it's so much uh, just to test this thing. That's like, <laughs> um, like, like some simple function. And uh, it's it's incredibly frustrating, and so I feel like AI and and like the tool that I'm making really helps you like take away a lot of these frustrations, uh, and just like gives you let's, let it lets coding be sort of fun again. Yeah, so you get to spend more time doing the fun bits and less time doing the yeah sort of the the things yeah. that you have to do. It's sort of like it's sort of like cooking without having to wash the dishes. Oh my God. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. There's like, there's that grind of doing the dishes and you're like, do I really have to? And you're like, yeah, do you want to eat? You got to do this part. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. So it, it, it takes away that part and you're, and you're like flowers going all over the place. It doesn't matter. Uh, something else is cleaning that up. Yeah. You can have a really messy kitchen and you don't have to worry about any of that. You just do the fun bits. Uh huh. Yeah. And that, like that. Uh, so the thing I was telling my teammates yesterday was there, there's this fear that AI is going to take over for us. And um, especially in coding, especially in data science, where like uh, I wrote this data science test and I like I just asked the AI to complete it and it, it passed, you know, so like mm -hmm. if it can do these data science tasks and it can do coding tasks what like us as data scientists and us as coders, where's our place? And having like worked with it intensely for the past six months, uh, I can say that like, it is not perfect. And it, it, it gets you like 80% of the way there. And the, the rest like takes like, tr like true, like understanding of the problem and, and like true, like coding skill to like get it the rest of the way and get it to be quality. And so for me, the, the metaphor is that a lot of things like, you know, like best practices, like unit tests and whatnot, that's like shoveling. And, and we've all just been shoveling, but then somebody came up with those, like one of these steam shovel excavator situations. And guess what? That makes you far more productive, but you actually have to be more skilled to be an an excavator driver than a shoveler. So that's true. Like, um, like my, my advice for people in the future of like, if you want to future proof your job is, is to like not give up, but to like work with AI intensely and figure out these tools now because they're not going away, but they still need drivers. They still need us to pilot them. Oh, I, I think that's actually a fascinating way to think about it. Uh, I love that, that it's, um, 
that, yeah, sure, you can do a lot more, but you have to be more skilled at what you do to do it. Just like I love the, I love the, like the versus, you know, a shovel, anyone can do that, but you have to get like certified to drive the, the big truck. Yeah. You know, yeah. and there's a lot more that can go wrong and all those things. So you have to really be good at it and train and, and I, yeah, it makes sense that, that, um, that if you, but if you embrace that tool, everyone's going to want to hire you, to, you know, next time they're building a house or whatever, because, um, or, or doing anything just because you're going to be able to get a lot more done much faster. Yeah. Um, and I, we can I build that. skyscrapers I, now, like we weren't yeah. able to before. And, and so yeah. I think, I think the, the, the jobs are going to shift, uh, yeah. in terms of what's in demand, but we're just going to be able to build more. So it's, it's not like yeah. there will be less work it's it's just going to be a different zone of skills that you're going to need and now we can like be building skyscrapers instead of just like single story houses yeah yeah I, love, I think that's a fascinating uh way to look at that and as an optimist i you know it resonates ah. with my outlook you know i i go yeah that's cool i mean cool things will come like, like skyscrapers are pretty cool uh, every time i go to new york i'm it's it's sort of a marvel just to look up at them and, and think, wow, you know, these are, these are things that we've built. Um, yeah. Yeah. And they were, and they were, you know, built due to advances in technology. Yeah. So Devra, what you're saying is, as Devra is, is sort of a way to, is like the steam shovel of, of shovels. <laughs> you know, it's this advanced thing that allows you to get a, a, a much bigger hole dug really quickly uh, but but at the same time, you have to kind of go in and, you know, you have to know what you're doing with it, I guess. Or or, or can you clarify that? Yeah. I, I, well, so um, you can go from zero to one. You can yeah. use it to fully start your project and, you know, say, um, I want a Python notebook that loads in this CSV and uh, performs this kind of analysis to produce this kind of result. And it will, it will do its best to start with that. Uh, it can also take existing projects and, and, and like try to add to those. But, um, but yeah, like you, I, f I feel it's folly to just fully trust it at this point. Mm -hmm. And like, okay. this is, Again, this is for me, like working like intensely with it um, and like and, and using it for my code. And like I used prototypes of Devra to like create the current version of, of Devra. And I would say like 90 percent of the current version, um, which is now like hundreds of thousands of lines of code, is 90 percent was done by AI mm -hmm. and the remaining was like where it just didn't quite get it. And, yeah. and so like, you still need those skills and like, you still need to always like, test what is produced and, yeah. um, and to critically evaluate what's out there. So, so yes, yeah, I, I think, I think it went from people having to do things on their own. And then suddenly chat GBD came out and they, they skipped ahead to what, like, to from, like, from in here is reasonable expectations. They skipped ahead to like unreasonable expectations for what uh, AI yeah. can do, and and um, so you can't do a prompt that's like make me a best selling game or something. Yeah. You know, like you're that's that's not going to happen. Like you you yeah. still need to have like kind of. Uh, uh, what's it called? Like incremental, uh, like granular um, input uh, of like definable tasks, and um, and to like and to monitor the quality of the output. Yeah. Well, I mean, so having tried Dev for myself, well, the thing I liked about it was, um, you know, often when I'm coding, what I like to do is, you know, and I think a lot of people like to do this is before I even get started, it's nice to find some example that's sort of in the ballpark of what I want to do. Like say, like I want to have a program that has a cool web interface. Well, if I can find like a template out there, that's like already like 80% of what I want, that's a great start. 
Uh, but what I loved about Devra for me is rather than have to like scour the internet and look at a lot of templates that weren't quite, a, weren't what I wanted at all until I found something that was like kind of close. What I liked about Devra is I just typed in what I wanted and it created all the files that I needed. And it, you know, it gave me that first order approximation of what I actually want immediately. And so, and it wasn't perfect, you know, and it wasn't, and it, you know, obviously it needs to be fixed, but that the whole idea wasn't to make it perfect to begin with. The whole idea was just to get me started. And yeah. I found it like yeah. super easy just to get started with that. And and my expectations were, this isn't going to be a perfect program. This is just going to get, get me in the ballpark where instead of having to create six different files from scratch, having to make a CSS file, an HTML file, a <laughs> JavaScript file, uh, having to make all those. It's laborious you know, just to Like even just yeah, exactly right. files, like, oh, God. Yeah, yeah you got to do all that. But what was cool with Devra is it just did that. And it made all those files for me. And it and it filled them with, with stuff that was sort of placeholder, but got me like 70, 80% of the way to where I wanted to go, where instead of having to create all those files, all I had to do is change a few lines, you know, and I had to know what I was doing. I couldn't just make stuff up and, and pretend like, Oh, this is great. I'm just going to use AI for everything. But it got me, it got me so far so quickly in, in, in what otherwise would have taken several days to get to that point. And, and I'm at a point where like, okay, you know, I could just change the things that I want and then make sure it works the way I expected. And I found that like super helpful for me. And I love the way you've you've done that, where you've just taken advantage of 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 sort of the chat GPT sort of back end API uh, to create sort of a company based on that. Um, uh, and and as a result, you've got this really cool product that for me is is super. Um, you know, it's it just takes like, again, the fun part of programming isn't searching for the template. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've you've eliminated that aspect and you've and you said oh no here's the template you want uh, immediately without having to search the internet here it is with all the files already created that's not the fun part the fun part is then like making it do what i want and that's and and that's that's what i'm left i'm left with the fun part so yeah the dishes anyways yeah, yeah exactly leave the dishes anyways, to somebody else Exactly. Leave the dishes to someone else. I guess in this case, it's like you do the dishes first and then you cook. Um. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I kind of like, um, I like the conversational aspect of it. So you mentioned that it didn't get it right the first time, but yeah. um, that's often that's partly on us, you know, in that, yeah. in that a prompt is there's, there's a, there's a vision that we have, but then what makes it to text that we're asking it to do is, you know, like for a website, for example, like you're probably not talking about color schemes. You're not thinking about like what the responsive design is going to be. Like there are probably like some details that you leave out of your, like what you want it to do. And so it does a first result and it's, it's, it's done in like, you know, two minutes. Like it's, it's pretty quick turnaround. And then you get to be like, oh, like I didn't specify this. I would like it to do this. And then you just sort of have a follow up response of where it'll say like, Hey, am I done? And you, and you say, um, no, like, could you make it responsive for mobile devices or no? Could you change the color scheme or no? Could you, um, give it like a more modern, uh, style look and then, and then, but it's like a back and forth and you, you sort of like, yeah. you sort of treat it like a person that you're working with where they'll, yeah they'll put some output out and then, you know, and it's more like a conversation than like a, than like a, like a single delivery and then it's done. Yeah. And, and I like that too, because at least from my perspective, I might have a sense of what I want it, what I want my program to do, but it's one of these things where once you get something that kind of does it, you realize, Oh, I'm missing these things. Or it would be cool if I did this other thing, you know, like, like for me, coding is sort of always an iterative process to begin yeah. with of, of I've got a concept in my head, I code it and I go, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's a great idea. And that is what I had in my head, but it'd actually be better if I change it this way. And so, so it gives you, so what you're saying with your, with Devra, you can like, you can say, Hey, give me this first order approximation. You can look at it and go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
I, what if we change the colors? You know, uh, this is cool. We need to change the colors or we need to, you know, like you were saying, make it more, look more modern or more contemporary, or can you make this look, you know, like something out of the Victorian area and make it steampunk, you know, you can, you <laughs> yeah. can, you I was, can realize I was this, uh, this video game with, with my son, Max, and yeah. like, he's super into gaming. He's, he's, uh, he just turned 11. And, um, so we were making this JavaScript game based on some drawings that he had. Uh, and he said, could you give it a vintage look? And I'm like, yeah. I don't know if an AI knows what vintage is, but I, I just like <laughs> give it a vintage look. And sure enough, it like gave it, it made it look like it was in a TV screen and had all these scan lines, like without, like I, I give uh, anyhow, like I'm always like sort of impressed with how it takes our like stupid human words and turns it into yeah. precise code that is like yeah. it's often sometimes better than what you were even imagining. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, Brian, we've had a great conversation and uh, it's, I think your program is really exciting. Uh, and throughout the conversation, you've given us lots of advice. Always be curious. That's one of my personal favorites. Yeah. Um, but do you have any other advice for people who might want to follow in your footsteps as both a data scientist and sort of an entrepreneur? Yeah. Um, well, so I am, I'm 48 and I feel like not a lot of people start businesses when they, when they have kids, when they have a full-time job, um, and, 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 you know, like it's, it's easy to kind of uh, be just worn out at the end of the day. And I, f I feel like if you are actually passionate about something, then to follow it and like just to, to create. And so like, if there's the always be curious, I feel there's an also another ABC, which is uh, like always be creating and, mm -hmm. Uh, I've made a lot of things. I've um, that a lot. The world was then just like, eh, no thanks, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you know, but and venture capitalists. I've I've, I've talked to a few of them. Th they will say things like, "Go and interview a hundred, uh, you know, potential customers and see what they want, and then create that." And that is a viable course of action. But when it's when it's just you and it's like you've put the kids to bed and it's, you know, nine o'clock and like now is your time to start programming or like you've woken up before everybody at 5 a.m. And now is your time to program. You you have energy to work on what you want to work on. And regardless of what other people are, like the world may want. And I know that might not be like the most business savvy way of approaching it, but like, but like you have to do what you physically and mentally can do. And so I feel like, I, I feel like don't discount being interested in something. Don't, because at the end of the day, you, st you still need to be the one doing it and creating it. So if go like do and create the things that you actually have, the drive to finish. And because uh, Steve Jobs said a lot of things, this was one of the cheesiest things he ever said, but it actually rings true. He said, real artists ship. And I know that's stupid, but, but like, it's, or it's, it's like phrased in corporate speak, but, but basically yeah. like if you create something, but stop before it's ready to show the world, then it's then it was just like it's just a hobby. Like that's the difference yeah. between a hobby and a viable product that the the world can use. And and yeah. so like do the thing that you can finish and to um, to prioritize like what is the like the the thing that the minimal things that need to be done, the most important things, and to like to stick with it and uh, you know to have friends that you like you show it to and um and then then get it out there like i i feel like that's i, I don't know if there's an easy way to sum that up but but I, to, I, I think there is you, okay you, what would like, you just well just get it get it done just get it yeah. done just get it done you know? uh 
and and yeah and like it's it won't not everything's going to be a success like you're yeah. um <laughs> I don't even want to go into all the number of things that were not successful for <laughs> no. me. They, they were also like in hindsight, I'm like, yeah, that makes total sense. Why the world, uh, didn't, you know, didn't like that. But, uh, but here I am again, trying it again. And like, and it's a thing that I personally have found incredibly useful and, yeah. um, other people I've shown it to, like I've shown other products to people and like, this is the first one where it's like everyone gets it immediately. And so I'm super stoked about this, this go round. That's awesome. Well, Brian, thank you very much for being on the, on the program. And I wish you good luck with Devra and whatever your next entrepreneurial idea is. <laughs> well, it's, I'm, I wanted to be this one and like do this one for a while, but yeah, no, thanks man. Thank you so much for having me. This is, this has been a, like a great time.